Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Well, good morning. I don't care if you're standing up or sitting down. I'm going to go ahead and start. But uh, today we're going to be uh, resuming our series in Romans. And in doing so, we're going to be examining chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. I intended on going through 32, but we're not going to get past 27 probably. So if the clock gets late and you're thinking it says 32 remember I said 27 so before we delve into it, let's pray together Heavenly Father you tell us in Hebrews 412 that your word is living and effective and that it's sharper than any double-edged sword and it penetrates as far as the separation of soul and spirit joints and marrow it's able to judge the ideas and thoughts of our hearts and Lord with that in mind I pray as we, we examine this passage in Romans 1 today that we would allow it to penetrate and judge our hearts so that we can apply it to our daily lives and be more conformed to the image of your Son. For Jesus' sake, amen. There are some passages in the Bible that many preachers may prefer not to cover, and the one we're examining today is, is one of them. Uh, I, for one, am not afraid to reveal what it says to us, but I also realize these things may not be as easy to hear. Yet if we're going to take the book of Romans seriously, we cannot skip this passage. It's in the Bible. We have to let it speak to us. Romans 1, 24 through 32, of which I'll just go through 27, is a dark and rather somber passage about the judgment of God upon a world that's gone mad with sin. And when we read it, we come face to face, in a sense, with our true condition. The late American preacher Donald Gray Barnhouse, who served for many years as pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia and hosted the well-known radio program, The Bible Study Hour, he called this one of the most terrible passages in the Bible because, to borrow of the words of Hebrews 10.31, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God and in doing so incurring his judgment and wrath. In the 18th century preacher and theologian and philosopher Jonathan Edwards delivered a sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God in Enfield, Connecticut in 1741. It was an appeal to sinners to recognize that they will be judged by God and that this judgment will be more fearful and painful than they can comprehend. Well, if you recall in our previous time together in verses 18 through 23 of Romans 1, we were introduced to the subject of God's wrath against sin. It's clearly and widely taught in the Bible. In his book entitled The Cross of Christ, the late British theologian John Stott defines God's wrath as, quote, his steady unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising antagonism to evil in all its forms and manifestations. It's referred to most often in the New Testament, including in Romans 1.18 by the Apostle Paul through the use of the Greek word orge. And it's, it's not an angry, sudden outburst, but a deliberate, settled hostility that remains constant over an extended period of time. The wrath of God, you see, does not have in it the ugly and hateful and petty and unpredictable nature that's typical of human anger. On the other hand, God's wrath is just and it's measured, and it's his response of his holiness toward evil. God's wrath or his anger is not something that resides in him by nature. It's his response to evil. In other words, it is something that's provoked. The Bible says God is love, as we know from 1 John 4, and that's his nature. You see, God's love is not provoked. He doesn't love us because he sees something good in us. He loves us because that's his nature, and we can never get beyond that. 
Paul tells us in Romans 8, 39 that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But God's wrath is different. It's his holy response to the intrusion of evil in this world. And if there were no sin in the world, then there would be no wrath in God. But as we all know, sin is in the world, and it has been since the fall of man recorded in Genesis 3. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that being Adam, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all sin. You see, friends, we all inherit a sin nature, and because we continue to sin against one another and against God, we all deserve God's wrath. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 3, that prior to knowing Christ, in our fallen condition as sinners, we were by nature children under wrath. God's wrath toward human sin is revealed in various ways. It's been revealed in cataclysmic ways, such as in catastrophes. In Genesis 7, we read of the catastrophes of the worldwide flood during the days of Noah. In Genesis 19, we read of the fire that burned up the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God's wrath will also be revealed in a massive way in the not too distant future. In Matthew 24 and 25, known as the Olivet Discourse, Jesus alluded to a future seven-year tribulation period when there will be great trials and a concentration of God's wrath upon this entire world. And that tribulation period is the subject of Revelation chapters 6 through 19, where John uses the Greek word thumos to refer to God's judgment that's revealed in the seven bold judgments of the tribulation period. That's the eschatological or end times wrath of God. It's, it's something, by the way, which we as believers, thankfully, are exempt from due to the pre-tribulation rapture of the church that's spelled out in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. In fact, the word church itself is absent from uh, Revelation 6 through 19. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 speaks of Jesus as our deliverer from the coming wrath. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says that God did not destine us for wrath, but for gaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God's wrath subsides in eternity because eternal justice has been served. Thus, God's wrath is temporal rather than eternal. And sin that is not dealt with incurs God's wrath, but sin that is dealt with subsides his wrath. And all sin will have been dealt with in eternity, either by grace or by law. And in Romans 1, Paul uses the Greek word orge for wrath to indicate that God's wrath is revealed today. In fact, it's revealed every day. In verse 18, as we saw last week, he says, For the wrath, or orge, of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. And the Greek word that's translated is revealed is apocalyptitai, which literally means is being revealed. It's a present tense reality. See, God's wrath is consistently and constantly being revealed in the world today. And it's directed toward everything that contradicts his holiness. It falls not only upon unbelievers, but also upon disobedient believers. Thus, God awaits one's choice for the unregenerate to believe and for the believer to obey. Thus, to extinguish the wrath of God requires obedience for the regenerate and faith for the unbeliever or unregenerate. One of the pictures that we rightly have of God is that of his patience, waiting for people to come to repentance. In 2 Peter 3, 9, we read that the Lord does not delay his promise, and that's in context regarding the future day of the Lord in verse 10, as some understand delay, but is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. In Romans 2, 4, Paul says that the kindness, restraint, and patience of God is intended to lead us to repentance. Exodus 34, 6 says that God is slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. And this exact phrase is repeated verbatim in several psalms, particularly 86 and 103 and 145. 
several Old Testament prophets also repeat it, such as Nehemiah and Joel and Jonah. And that's to say nothing of the more than 200 times that the Bible uses the Hebrew word kesed, which is translated various ways depending on your English translation in your Bible. One is long-suffering. Another one is faithful love. Another one is steadfast love, loyal love, and loving kindness. And this word describes the covenant faithfulness of God to his people, bearing patiently through their times of disobedience. And this is to say nothing of the hundreds of times in Scripture when God is described as merciful, gracious, and loving. So indeed, our God is a patient God. He patiently waits for us to turn to him in repentance. And yet, we can easily fall into error if this is the only picture we have of God, waiting passively upon his creatures to turn from their sin. Because there's a time, there's a time when the patience of God will run its course. Exodus 34, 7 says that he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. So there's a time when judgment begins when God gives up on people, allowing them to fulfill their desires. In fact, if God did not do this, he would be forcing people to do what he wanted, and that goes against his nature. Therefore, God gives people, in a sense, over to their own devices. In Genesis 6-3, God said, My spirit will not strive with man forever. And he proved his determination not to strive with man by judging the whole world with a flood. In other words, you see, God's patience has a limit. However, Paul's reference to God's wrath in Romans 1 that we're looking at this morning is not something that's an active outpouring of divine displeasure, but it's simply the removal of restraint that allows sinners to reap the fruits, the just fruits of their rebellion. And this is a subject that Paul deals with in, in uh, Romans 1, 24 through 32. Now, as we proceed through this passage this morning, we'll see the phrase, God delivered them over or gave them up, repeated three times in verses 24, 26, and 28. For example, in verse 24, you read, Therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. Verse 26, For this reason God delivered them over to dishonorable passions. Then verse 28, and because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind. We could, in a sense, call this God's three deliveries. The same Greek verb, pyrenokan, is used each time, and it means to hand over, to give over, to deliver, to turn over, or to give up a person. It's a judicial word that means yielding another person over to punishment or judgment. In fact, it's used of Judas, who delivered over or betrayed Jesus in Matthew 26. In Romans 1 here, it's used of God giving people over to their own sinful desires. It's similar to what God said to Israel in Psalm 81:12. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own plans. In judgment, then, God gives them up and abandons people to their own sinful way. They abandon God, so he abandons them. And in judgment, then, God gives them up, delivering them over to their own sinful desires and takes away restraint, just like a, a dog does that's let loose from his leash. I know what that's like with a beagle when you see a rabbit. <laughs> and God lets sinful people do what they want. It's like what Paul says in Galatians 6, 7. God lets people reap what they sow. When people abandon God in their thinking, then God abandons them. Why does he do that? In a sense, because he's, he's like a perfect gentleman. God respects the freedom of the human will. And if a person decides to live without him, it's as if God says, fine, you can live without me. And in the end, you'll be sorry, but if that's your decision, I'll respect it. And if people persist in fleeing from God, he loves them enough to grant them their wish, though... It is not his ultimate purpose. And with the restraints removed, sometimes the consequences of rebellion alone will, will cause people to reconsider God 
In his 1940 book entitled The Problem of Pain, the late British author and Christian apologist C.S. Lewis argues that human pain and hell are not sufficient reason to reject belief in a good and powerful God. He says, I willingly believe that the damned are in one sense successful rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have determined or demanded and are therefore self-enslaved, just as the blessed forever submitting to obedience become through all eternity more and more free. And in his 1945 novel, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis reflects on the Christian conceptions of heaven and hell, and he says there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. And when God abandons people, there's a deeper reason at work. God abandons people, in a sense, so that they'll see what life is like without him. In that sense, there's a redemptive purpose that stands behind the wrath of God. By letting people go their own way, he's not just punishing them, but he's allowing them to see the emptiness of life without him. You know, friends, it's only when we come to the end of ourselves that we're ready to really think about Jesus Christ. But when that moment of emptiness comes, when we finally face the, the God-shaped vacuum inside, when we discover that disobedience only leads to pain, when we reap the bitter harvest of our own sin, then and only then have we become a candidate for the grace of God. Unfortunately, some people never figure that out in time. They die without realizing the folly of their own behavior. But others come to the end, and finally, after making many mistakes, they begin to look up. And when they do, they find that God is there waiting for them. And that's the positive end. Now here in Romans 1, 24 through 32, however, we're at the negative end. This passage tells us that people choose sin over God because sin is bound up in their own heart. And here we see the downward progress of the human race as it steadily moves away from God. Each step takes people further away from God and deeper into moral depravity. And each time the threefold phrase, God delivered them over, is used, it describes a further stage in man's turning away from God. Stage one is bad. Stage two is worse. And stage three is worse still. In the end, society has then turned all moral values upside down. Well, what are these three stages? What are the results of man's abandoning God? The first of these, the first result is idolatry, which is brought out in verses 24 and 25. We read, Therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Amen. Notice again, verse 24 begins with the word therefore, which then points us back to verses 21 through 23. And there we see the five fatal steps of idolatry. First of these is that people are indifferent to the truth they know. In verse 21 First part of that says, For they, though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Secondly, their minds become confused. In verse 21, the second part says, Instead, their thinking became worthless. Third step, their hearts are darkened, so they no longer know the difference between right and wrong. Continuing on verse 21, And their senseless hearts were darkened. The fourth step, they think they can live without God. Verse 22 says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And fifth step, they turned to idolatry. And verse 23 says that exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Verse 25 gives us a good definition of idolatry. Exchanging 
the truth of God for a lie and worshiping and serving created things rather than the creator. You know, when people abandon God, they start a downward path. And when there's no restraint from the hand of God, then sexual impurity, as mentioned in verse 24, takes over. Two sexual sins come to the forefront in this downward step. One is fornication, which is sex between two unmarried people or premarital sex. And the other is adultery. You might recall a couple weeks ago, we, weeks ago, we saw Jesus re draw attention to that in Dave's sermon on Matthew 5, thir verses 31 and 32. Notice the phrase, in the desires of the hearts, in verse 24. Paul warns us in Galatians 5, 16, not to carry out the desires of the flesh. But notice here that Paul speaks of the desires of the heart. The desires of the heart are much deeper rooted than the desires of the flesh. And then Paul says, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, in verse 24. The Greek verb, atomezestai, which is translated dishonor here, means to abuse or to regard lightly. You see, friends, man's body was created to house the Holy Spirit and thereby honor God, as, as Paul had earlier written in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. But man, because he would not honor God, changed the body into that which dishonors God. And since man refuses to live by God's law, he invents his own law. And the result is that man also invents his own gods. The chief god usually being self. Man needs a god that will condone his sinful behavior. So he lives for himself and his invented gods. Well, the second result of abandoning God is immorality. Mentioned in verses 26 and 27, we read, For this reason God delivered them over to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men, in the same way, also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed in their passions for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So we see, what we see here is that idolatry leads to immorality, which in turn leads to homosexuality. And because people exchange the truth for a lie, in verse 25, God allowed them to degrade themselves with, as Paul writes here, dishonorable passions. And the result was that they exchanged natural human functions for what is unnatural. In verses 26 and 27, the Greek words, Thalei for women in verse 26 and arsonist for men in verse 27 are not actually the com they're not the common Greek words used for women which is gune and men which is on air they really mean females and males now what's ironic here is that the homosexuality that's described in these verses does not characterize females and males of other animal species only characterizes human beings in their fallen state. You know, friends, homosexuality is a perversion because it uses sex for a purpose contrary to those which God created and intended it, as we're told in Genesis 1.28 and 2.24. The Bible describes homosexuality not as an alternative lifestyle, but as a dishonorable passion, meaning disgraceful or shameful. It's not a medical issue, it's a spiritual one. The Bible goes on to say that it's against nature. When people forsake the author of nature, being God, they go against the order of nature. And because nature, as God defines it in Genesis, is that he created man and woman, male and female, and the two shall join together as be as one. And that is nature, one man and one woman. As is often said, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. When thinking about this issue from a biblical spec perspective, three facts come into clear focus. First of all, homosexuality is a willful choice, not a biological imperative. Everything the Bible has to say about homosexuality begins with this fact, that homosexuality is a, is a choice. It's a learned behavior a chosen path, a personal lifestyle decision. 
Verse 26 says it, it, it is a deliberate exchange of the natural for the unnatural. It's a willful abandonment of what is right in favor of what is wrong. Not, as, not only is homosexuality a willful choice, but it's also one that completely reverses the natural order of creation. It reverses God's plan for the human race established in the Garden of Eden. It's thoroughly unnatural. Literally, it's against nature. Men and women have to deliberately repress the way God made them in order to practice homosexuality. We can take it further. Paul says that the sin of homosexuality involves shameful lust, which leads to indecent acts, and therefore it's perversion, which leads to a due penalty from God. Paul says homosexuality is a terrible sin. It's degrading, indecent, perverted, evil, and wrong. But more than anything else, homosexuality is a willful choice. No one can truthfully say they were born that way. No one is born homosexual. And anyone who argues otherwise is either ignorant of the Bible or has deliberately perverted its teaching. And we can talk all we want to about genetics, absent fathers, overprotective mothers, early sexual conversion, and even sexual abuse. And some of those deeds may indeed create a predisposition to this particular sin, but the fact remains, every single act of homosexuality is a personal moral choice, one for which God will hold us 100% accountable. Well, the second fact is that homosexuality is a specific sign of a godless society. Remember, Paul was writing to the Romans, and history records that ancient Greece and Rome were hotbeds of homosexuality. Many of our most revered philosophers were homosexuals, as were many of the political leaders of that day. The late Scottish author and theologian William Barclay says that Roman society from top to bottom was riddled with unnatural vice. Fourteen of the first fifteen Roman emperors were homosexuals. And yet Rome never reached the level of six homosexuality that has come to be known in America today. As, as a society moves away from God, one mark of its drift into judgment is widespread homosexuality. And that's where America, by and large, is today. On, on every front, we're told that homosexuality is good and right and normal. In fact, you try to you try to search Google something negative about homosexuality, you can't find it. Everything's just glorifying it. Those who oppose it or dare to speak out against it are called homophobes or bigots or hate mongers. And all across our country, those who identify themselves as gay and lesbian are, they're as they say, coming out of the closet, not in disgrace and shame they deserve, but to the cheers of the crowd, to the approval of people in the mainstream media. It's even infecting our military. It's good, they say, to come to grips with who you really are. It's time to get rid of the restrictions of the past, which treated homosexuality as a sin. It's time that we all accepted gays and lesbians as decent, upright, law-abiding, and God-fearing moral people. Well, one offshoot of homosexuality that's really been gaining steam lately is transgenderism. In March of 2023, Democratic Governor Tim Walz, who has been in the news lately, I think most of you have probably heard of him, he signed an executive order to protect the rights of the people from Minnesota and other states to receive gender-affirming health care in the state. Minnesota lawmakers passed legislation to make their state a trans refuge for young people seeking sex change surgery. The legislation is meant to ensure that children undergoing gender transition procedures allowed under Minnesota law cannot be governed by child protection laws of other states. So then it also allows children to be taken from parents if they don't support the child's wish for transgender surgery. Last year, as you all know as well, laws signed into law, a 
a law which took effect January 1 that requires Minnesota public schools to even to provide feminine hygiene products to all restroom, restrooms used by both girls and boys in grades 4 to 12. You know, whenever people turn away from God, terrible things begin to happen in society. Long-held standards disappear. Things once considered out of bounds have now become commonplace. As we witnessed in Olympic boxing this past week, the basic distinctions between male and female are obliterated. And in such an atmosphere, homosexuality is first tolerated, and then it's accepted, then praised, and finally enshrined as the ultimate freedom. Well, the catalyst for all this occurred back on June 26, 2015, when the United States Supreme Court ruled in the Obergefell decision that state-level bans on same-sex marriage are unconstitutional. And more and more, our society has been pushed in the direction by advocates of the LGBTQ agenda, groups and legislation, and school curriculum, and, and books, and advertisements, movies, and constitutional amendments have all been aimed at normalizing the homosexual lifestyle. And what's worse than that, however, is the negative impact which the LBGTQ agenda has on our nation is that even many churches in America have caved on this issue. Hardly a week passes where I don't hear about another church that's ordaining gays and lesbians to the ministry. The situation is so bad that mainline denominations no longer have what to believe on this issue. And the issue of whether or not to condemn homosexuality is up for debate in denominations like the United Church of Christ, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Methodist Church, the American Baptist Churches USA, and the Episcopal Church, and others. What's tragic is that Bible, -believing, uh, Bible believers in those denominations are slowly being squeezed out, and anyone who dares challenge the status quo is ridiculed for his or her fundamentalism. Well, across our country, there's a group of apostates called the More Light Movement, and they have reinterpreted the Bible in order to justify practicing homosexuals as members of the church. More Light is one of several American Christian LGBT welcoming church programs for gay inclusion in America. And within the Presbyterian Church USA, the covenant network of Presbyterians also works to enshrine the full participation of LGBTQ individuals in the life of the church and society. It's not Christian. It's a godless position. What's sad, though, is that so many church leaders have said that we don't know whether or not homosexuality is right or wrong. Paul would call that a sign of a depraved mind. And he deals with that he used that term in verses 28 through 32. You know, friends, we don't have to decide whether something is right or wrong when, when God has already clearly spoken on the issue. If God says it's wrong, it doesn't matter what anyone else says, it's sin. There's perhaps no greater misnomer in the English language than to call homosexuals gay. I always think of that Fred Flintstone song, if you're as old as I am, we'll have a gay old time, but there's nothing gay about the, the LGBTQ agenda. There's nothing gay about homosexuals or the way they live. There's nothing but gay. A lot of, their, a lot of these people their life is really a trail of tears, heartache, anger, frustration, and guilt. Each day is evil because they've chosen to do evil. Tomorrow holds no promise except the promise of more pain. You won't see that brought out in the news, but that's the way they are in the inside. But to leave the matter there would be incomplete and misleading because the Bible does more than condemn homosexuality. It also show, shows a way out. Homosexuality is a sin that can indeed be forgiven. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, 
Paul wrote to Christians, and he said, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you once lived this way, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now what we need to recognize here that the word unrighteous in verse 9, it has no definite article or the word the preceding it in the Greek, which emphasizes one's character rather than one's spiritual position. Thus, it can describe both believers, disobedient believers, and unbelievers who lack godly character. Now, unbelievers will neither inherit nor enter the kingdom. Unrighteous believers will enter the kingdom, but they won't inherit the kingdom. Paul was talking to carnal believers who then would suffer loss of the bema or the judgment seat of Christ. But he's not talking about the impossible loss of eternal salvation. They have eternal life that can never be lost, and yet these believers will not inherit the kingdom of God because of their practice of unrighteousness. The word inherit then expresses the wider meaning of entering into full possession of a family inheritance. Thus, inheriting the kingdom of God is not equivalent to entering God's kingdom. In verse 11, Paul reminded the Corinthian Christians again that some of you once lived this way, but you were washed, sanctified, and justified. And though these Corinthian believers had practiced such things, and some of them were still doing it, they had nonetheless been washed from their sins, sanctified, posi positionally set apart to God, and justified or declared righteousness in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You see, friends, these truths are true of position of every believer, even unrighteous ones. These truths are true of the position of every believer. And Paul is simply calling for believers to live up to their position. Well, as Christians... Our response to issues such as these calls not just for political action, but more redemptively, intercessory prayer for those who've been deceived and trapped by the trans agenda. It's a condition that... Uh, My wife's nephew was confused over the point, and uh, I don't know whether he, we don't know whether he was a Christian or not, but he ultimately took his life this past year. Perhaps you might know someone struggling with this issue. But the, the most powerful weapons we have to defeat this evil is the truth of Scripture and our prayers to Almighty God. You know, friends, each of us can come to the throne of grace with confidence to intercede for deliverance for those who are trapped in the delusion of transgenderism. The ministry known as Intercessors for America, founded in 1973, is the largest national prayer ministry dedicated to calling Christians to pray for issues facing our nation. And they put together a list of what's called 25 ways to pray for those who are transgender. I made a copy of these from the website available for you to take home. When you leave this morning, there's three groups of them on these tables as you walk out. But I'll also include a link on our Facebook page if you're viewing us online. This is kind of a good way to end there on, on a little more positive note, because verses 20 through, 28 through 32 are not very positive in a sense either. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we see this morning how accurately these words in the latter part of Romans 1 have described our own times in America, our own civilization, our own country. And Lord, as we see the marks of godlessness on every side, in agreement with the description that Paul gives us here in Romans, 
We know that you have not forsaken this world. We know that the message of truth and light is still as available as ever. And we know that your love is behind it all. Lord, we know that your love reaches out to broken, fragmented, hurting people and longs to set us free from the results of our own sin. So, Father, we thank you for this. And we pray for those who have been deceived by and trapped in the trans agenda. We pray that you would make yourself real to them so that they might find their identities in you. We pray that many today may find the new life that you offer in Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we ask it. Amen.